I have a real treat for you today. I saw an amazing essay from my grandfather this week. I read some things that I'm going to share with you on this week's edition of the Parsha Podcast. I read some things that I don't think I will ever forget, and I'm pretty convinced that neither will you. I saw things that were so interesting and so valuable and so topical for the period that we are in, in the run-up to Rosh Hashanah Kippur, in the season of repentance. I saw things, I read things that I think will radically reshape my life and maybe even yours. Wait a minute. Radically reshape your life? That sounds scary. That sounds intimidating. Maybe I should quickly turn off the podcast. I don't want Rabbi Wolby to radically reshape my life. This is not what I signed up for when I subscribed to the Parsha podcast. Relax. We're going to reshape your life, my life, all of our lives together. But it's going to be for the better. And it's going to be dramatically so. It's going to make you much more productive. It's going to make your life much more meaningful. It's going to make your life much more interesting. And also, what we're going to discover is just on its own. Forget about what it's going to do to you. But on its own, it is just fascinating. So worry not. And let's begin. Our Parsha, Parsha's Tisaitse, has more mitzvos than any Parsha of the 54 installments of the Torah, the 54 Parshas of the Torah. And of course, there are all kinds of mitzvos. And every year during this Parsha, I get the sense that we're going on a tour throughout the seas of the Talmud. But I'll focus on today, in this week's edition of the Parsha podcast, I want to focus on one of the mitzvos of our Parsha, and the very interesting and quizzical midrash that's associated with that mitzvah. So we read in chapter 22 of the book of Devarim, verse 6 and 7, it tells us that when we chance upon a mother bird in a nest, and in the nest there are eggs or little, small little birds, and the mom is crouching upon the eggs or the birds, we cannot take the mom upon the children. Instead, we have to send away the mom. And then we take the children, the baby chicks, the baby birds, the eggs. We take that for us. That's the mitzvah. Send away the mother bird and take the eggs and the chicks for ourselves, says the verse, in order that the Almighty will be good to us and we will live a long life. That's one of the mitzvahs of our parsha. And interestingly, this mitzvah is actually a launch pad for many debates and treatises even about mitzvahs in general. So, for example, there's a very long Ramban in his commentary to that mitzvah where he talks about what is the purpose of mitzvahs in general. In fact, there's even a Mishnah that the Ramban quotes about this subject. But regardless, we have a mitzvah, mitzvah is to send away the mother bird, and we have the reward associated with that the Almighty will do good to us and we will live a long life. Now, of course, it's a great mystery. Why exactly is this mitzvah in particular the one that begets the great reward of a long life? So Rashi really gives us an answer. Rashi says, well, this is such an easy mitzvah. It's such an inexpensive mitzvah. It doesn't cost anything. And nevertheless, in this easy and inexpensive mitzvah, the Almighty promises that he's going to give us a good life, a long life. Well, all the more so. By the other mitzvahs that are very expensive, you gotta buy an S road, you gotta build a circle, you gotta buy matzah. There's mitzvahs that are very expensive. And if the cheap and easy mitzvah gives us this amazing blessing, well, all the more so, the more expensive, the more difficult mitzvahs give us a blessing for sure. That's what Rashi offers to us in his commentary on this mitzvah. But there's a very interesting midrash. And today we're going to focus on an angle of this Midrash. So the Midrash tells us that there are 630 mitzvahs. That's a number that we are familiar with. 630 mitzvahs. Of those mitzvahs, some of them are positive mitzvahs, meaning do something, do something positive. And some of them are negative mitzvahs, withhold, refrain from the transgressions. And the Midrash tells us 
and this is featured elsewhere in Jewish literature, there are 248 positive mitzvos, and there are 365 negative mitzvos, transgressions. And then it gets a little bit more granular. There's 248 positive mitzvos, and that corresponds to the amount of limbs that a person has. And every single day, the limbs scream at a person and they say, do the mitzvos so that we will merit and we will have a long life. And the 365 negative mitzvos correspond to the days of the year. The solar year, of course, we have a lunar month, but a solar year. And every day when the sun rises until the sun sets, the sun, so to speak, screams at the person and says, I command you to do a mitzvah, to not do a transgression, and don't destroy and condemn the world and yourself with sin. Thus concludes the Midrash. There's 613 mitzvahs, and every mitzvah, it has a reward. Some have this reward, some have that reward. And this mitzvah, the particular mitzvah that we're talking about, sending away the mother bird, it tells us the reward that we should have a good life and we will live long. So that's the Midrash. There are 365 negative mitzvos and 248 positive mitzvos, bringing a total of 613. And these are not random numbers. The positive mitzvos correspond to the limbs of the person. And by the Torah's calculations, there are 248 different limbs. And each day they urge and beseech man, fulfill us so you can live long. And the negative mitzvos correspond to the days of the year. Each day corresponds to one transgression, and each day from sunrise to sunset, man is urged to not transgress and thereby condemn himself and all of humanity to doom. Now, my grandfather, blessed memory, in his essay, he begins to parse out and examine this midrash. So he says that the fact that there are 248 positive mitzvos corresponding to the amount of limbs that a person has, that's not a meaningless trope. That's the essence of a person's existence. Every physical bodily organ or limb has a corresponding spiritual organ and limb. This is that you have a soul. The soul and the body are related to each other, just as the body is related to a garment, meaning that the body is there to enshroud the soul, and therefore if the body has 248 limbs, that's because it is tailored to sheath and cover the soul that also has 248 limbs. And the deep insight is that when a person dies, their body becomes useless, It becomes a liability. It's got to be buried. It begins to decompose. But the soul lives on. And what part of the soul lives on? Well, all 248 limbs of the soul live on. But what is the condition of those limbs? That hinges upon a person's lifetime of mitzvos. If a person does all 248 positive mitzvos, well, then they have earned, they have fixed, they have acquired those corresponding spiritual limbs, and thus their soul can flourish for eternity. So, for example, my grandfather brings the verse, By charity, You should surely open your hand and give charity. That's a reference to your spiritual hand. Via fulfillment of the mitzvah of charity, You are creating and sustaining and nurturing and completing and fixing the spiritual hand, so to speak, that part of the soul, that limb, that organ of the soul. And therefore, you've achieved via this mitzvah, you've acquired, you've unlocked that part of your soul. And that is true across the board, 240 positive mitzvahs corresponding to 248 limbs of the soul. We have 248 physical limbs and 248 spiritual limbs of the soul. And via the fulfillment of the 248 positive mitzvos, 
We create a spiritual avatar of ourselves, and that is us in the spiritual world. So this is an astonishing idea. And we're just getting warmed up. This is an astonishing idea. Mitzvahs are not a favor that we do for God. Some sort of religious ritual or religious ceremony that we have to do. Mitzvahs are us creating, nurturing, sustaining, unlocking, fixing our spiritual halves. We're feeding our soul. We're making sure that it is strong and robust for its life, which is, which is really our life. After our transient stint in this world concludes, we're going to be a soul and those mitzvahs are going to ensure that that soul is strong and robust and healthy and can partake in the delights of the spiritual world. Well, okay, that's the 248 positive mitzvahs. What about the 365? How are the days of the year, every day, from sunrise to sunset, we mustn't sin, how is that congruent with this idea? 248 made sense. That's what our soul is comprised of. That's our spiritual body double. But what do the days of the year, making sure that we fulfill the spiritual tasks associated with each day, what does that have to do with our eternal spiritual selves. And here is where things get really interesting. He gives an answer based upon a groundbreaking Kabbalistic insight. It's so interesting. It's so delightful. And it's also a little startling. This is found in the Arachaim and his commentary in the beginning of Parshas Vayichi. Parsha of Aichi is the last Parsha of the book of Genesis. And it begins, Jacob is in Egypt. And he has been living there for 17 years. And his days are waning. And he summons Joseph to request that he be buried in Israel. Don't bury me in Egypt. Bring me back to Israel. Bury me in the cave of the patriarchs where Abram and Isaac are buried. That's the second verse of the Parsha, Parsha's Vayichi. Vayikruvu yimei Yisrael amus, the days of Jacob got close to dying, and he calls Joseph, and he makes a request. He submits a request, don't bury me in Egypt, bury me in the land of Canaan. And the question that I'm trying to figure out here, the Ramban, other commentaries, how does Jacob know that he is about to die. How did Jacob have a premonition that his demise was imminent? In fact, the verse is precise. Vayikrevu yimei Yisrael amus. The days of Israel, which is Jacob, the days of Jacob, of Israel, came near. How do days become close to dying? It should have said that Jacob was about to die. It doesn't say that. It says the days of Jacob drew near to a close, and that's a very unusual way to describe someone's pending demise. And that's the question that the Archaim asks, and he gives an answer based upon an idea from the Arizal. The Arizal, of course, the greatest of the Kabbalists. And the Arizal says that the soul is actually divided up into little sparks, sparks of soul. And in every incarnation of life, a person is assigned a certain amount of sparks of their soul. And the total amount of sparks of soul that a person is assigned to, that corresponds to the amount of days that they live. And every day has its corresponding spark of soul. And if a person does a mitzvah, fulfills the mitzvahs of that day, well then, that spark has been actualized, has been completed, has been fixed. And the day that a person does not do any mitzvahs, well, the spark corresponding to that day that spark is blemished. 
That's the idea of the Arizal. Again, featured in the Arachim's commentary on the second verse of Parshas Vayechi. Wow, how's that for a new idea? You don't have a full soul. Your soul is divided up into sparks, little sparklets of soul. And the amount of sparks of soul that you have corresponds to the days of life that you are given. And each day you have an opportunity to fix, to actualize the spark of that day. And you do that via mitzvah. And if you neglect that day's responsibility, then that day's spark is blemished. Now the Arachayim, before he explains how this is an answer to his question, he elaborates on this principle and he shows how it really illuminates all kinds of other areas of Jewish philosophy and literature. So, for example, he says, this helps us understand the concept of sleep. Sleep is the changing of the guard. Every day, you have a spark of your soul. And Sunday, you have one spark. And if the Almighty gives you another day to live, that means you have a second spark for Monday. And that's a different spark that comes in on Tuesday. And when you sleep... That's the changing of the guard. You're swapping out yesterday's sparklet and you're updating it and replacing it and installing today's spark of soul. That's what sleep's about. And thus, when the Talmud says that sleep is a 60th of death, what does that mean? Now we know what it means. Death is when your soul departs. Sleep is a 60th of it. It's not your whole soul departing. It's the spark that you had today. Leaving, departing, ascending, and the new one coming in its place. Now he goes on to say, something really interesting. (laughs) He says that after a spark departs, it doesn't leave completely. It sticks around a little bit. But it's not fully there, but it's not fully gone. And he points out that this is actually a great benefit because once you succeed in a given day, so that spark has been checked off, it's a success, it's money in the bank. You can't lose it. It's far enough away that if you mess up, if you sin, if you get corrupted, well, the spark of the day that you were good, that one is now removed to a certain extent. You can't mess it up. You can't tarnish it once it's been a success. But what if it was a failure? What if that spark of that given day was flawed? It was blemished. It's not gone completely. It's still close enough to be rectifiable with repentance. So we have kindness on both sides. If it's a good spark, you did your responsibility for that day, you did the mitzvos, you elevated that spark, well then, that one's good. It's far away, you can't mess it up in the future. But if you failed, it's not too far, you could still retrieve it and fix it with repentance. So we have the concept of sleep, repentance, the association of the de parted sparks with a person. It's too far to corrupt the good ones. But the flawed ones are still retrievable and rectifiable via repentance. This is some heavy, mind-bending stuff here in the Arachayim based upon this Arizal. Now, it's a very long piece, and he continues to talk about this point and this principle at great detail. So, for example, he answers with this principle another common question about the longevity of Adam and all the generations from Adam to Noah. Adam lived 930 years and one guy lives nine this and nine that and 800 and 700. And you compare that to us, you know, if you live a really long life, you're 100, 110. What changed? It's a pretty good question. So he uses this principle to resolve that question. And he brings a beautiful parable 
of a king who has piles and piles of diamonds and he instructs his servants to polish the diamonds for him. And he says, I'm going to give you a huge stack of diamonds, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of diamonds, and every day you polish one of them. And the earlier generations, they got massive mounds of diamonds. So I definitely did the math. Adam lived for 930 years. That is equivalent to 339,450 days, meaning that Abraham got 339,450 sparks of soul, i.e. diamonds, and every day he was tasked with polishing a single diamond. And the earlier generations got a much more challenging responsibility. But then when the early generations failed, the Almighty lightened the load for the successive generations, and thus from Noah onward, the load was much lighter. People lived, I don't know, 100 years, 180 years, but much less than 900 plus. And then he talks about how this principle can explain the mental decline of old age. And then he talks about how this principle can explain the difference between the death of a young person and that of an old person. And again, this is a very long piece if you want to look at it. Second verse in Parshas Vayichi. And then he talks about what happens before a person dies. Before a person dies, all those sparks that we said had not fully ascended to heaven, but are still not within a person, it's too far away to corrupt the good ones, it's close enough to achieve the bad ones. All those sparks coalesce within a person as the person is about to die. And thus, when it says that the days of Jacob drew near to dying, that, of course, is a reference to the days. What are the days? The days are the sparks of the soul assigned to each person. And when Jacob sensed that all the sparks of his life were gathering together, he knew that his death was imminent. Of course, most of us, we don't have those same sensitivities to pick up on the change of our soul. Every day really feels the same. You know, you don't really feel that there's a new spark within you, even though maybe we do feel it a little bit. You know, if you're having a bad day, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, and suddenly you're a new person. But Jacob sensed that there was an infusion of all these sparks, and he knew what that meant, because he's Jacob, and therefore he summoned Joseph. And thus concludes the Archaim. That is what it means that the days of Jacob got close to dying. He knew he was going to die. And the days of his life are the, the essence, so to speak, of his life. Because each one of them corresponds to a spark. And that's why he knew to summon Joseph. What an amazing insight. A day is a spiritual entity relative to the soul relative to the spiritual avatar that is a person after a person's brief sojourn in this world. Each day has its own sparklet of soul, and each day has its own spiritual responsibility. And if a person fulfilled the responsibility of a given day, then they've fixed and upgraded and acquired that corresponding spark of soul. And God forbid if a person allows a day to be wasted, well, that spark is flawed. It's flawed forever. Of course, you can fix it with repentance, and that's a wonderful gift, but that opportunity is gone. The soul that you have tomorrow is a different soul, or sparklet of soul. And we have 630 mitzvos. And now we see how both kinds of mitzvos, both groups of mitzvos, correspond to a person's essence and soul. The 248 positive mitzvos, that corresponds to the spiritual makeup of the soul. Each mitzvah corresponds to a spiritual limb. And just as the 248 positive mitzvos correspond to the essence of a person's soul, so too the negative mitzvos corresponding to the days every day is its own sparklet and its own little component of the general soul that you have. And that's our job. 
Our job over here, via the mitzvos, is to make sure that we are ready for the time when we're just a soul. And how do we do that? Positive mitzvos, negative mitzvos. Make sure that we tend to our soul and all 248 parts of that soul. And make sure that every day and every sparklet of soul that we get on that day is tended to, is addressed, is uplifted. Each one of those diamonds is polished. We do our responsibility each day. Now, my grandfather, a blessed memory in this essay, he connects this principle to an amazing midrash about the daily manna. So the verse describes the manna that the nation goes out to collect the manna, yom biyomo, every single day. And the midrash says something astonishing. The Midrash says that the Almighty treats us the way we treat him. There is like a bilateral relationship here. And the Almighty says to the Jewish people, so to speak, I'm going to give you the Torah. And the objective of the Torah is that you study it day by day, every single day, never missing a day. And therefore, because I'm demanding for you to study the Torah every day, I promise that I am going to shower you each day, every day, with food from heaven, says the Midrash. That is the meaning of the verse that says the nation went out to collect the manna, yom biyomo, every day. If you study this Midrash, you discover that there is an amazing insight over here. The Almighty gave us the Torah. Why did the Almighty give us the Torah? I'm going to read you the Midrash. Ani nasati lechem the Torah. I gave you the Torah. Sheti you ostimba yom yom. That you should study it. You should be involved with it every day. Absent this Midrash, I would have thought that the Almighty gave us the Torah to study it, to learn it, to know it. And the fact that we study it every day, well, you need to have time to study it. So therefore, every day, it's a good idea to study Torah to facilitate the study. And here it says the opposite. The Almighty gave us the Torah as a means to study it each day. It's almost the opposite. It's almost as if the days of this equation are primary. The days that we study Torah each day It's not about the Torah. It's about infusing that day with what it needs. According to this world-shifting principle of the Arizal, every day is a new spark, and our job is to make sure that no spark is left behind. And there is this duality. We have the spiritual limbs, 248 of them, And the days, every day of our life, and those too, make up our spiritual future. And we have to tend to every single one of them. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense. The Torah is given to us in order for us to achieve our mission. And our mission is that every single sparklet that we have is given whatever it needs. And therefore, the Torah is given to us to study every day. Every spark should have Torah, we shouldn't go a day without studying. This is a totally revolutionary insight. And again, my grandfather in the essay, he poses a hypothetical question. If we were to ask, what is our spiritual objective when we study Torah, when we do mitzvos? Is it to become a great Torah scholar to do mounds and mounds of mitzvos? Or it is that we should study Torah every day, do mitzvos every day? We would have said, well, study lots of Torah, do lots of mitzvos. And of course, that's true. But the primary goal is that we should never lose a day of our life, that we don't have a touch point with the spiritual. This is why we got Torah. To have something to uplift us every day, to uplift every single spark with Torah and mitzvos every single day. And the manna is really 
given to us to get us in the zone, in the mode of doing something every day. The Abayi could have given us manna, just a massive pile of manna every Sunday for the whole week, meal planning, and then we recover for a week and come back the following week. But no, the manna is the preparation for Torah. And the manna is getting us accustomed to doing something on a daily basis. That is the objective of the manna, and that is the objective of Torah. This, of course, makes us think a lot about the Dafyomi. The Dafyomi is a revolutionary system of Torah study, where you study a page of Talmud, a daf of Talmud, a page of Talmud, Yomi, every single day. Take no days off. Even on Tisha B'Av, when you're not allowed to study Torah, you make it up after Tisha B'Av is over. Every single day. Not a single day without Torah study. Makes a lot of sense. It's not necessarily about the volume of Torah study. It's about making sure that every day is addressed. No spark is left behind. Back to the Midrash. Every day, from morning to night, is screaming at us. Don't squander this day's opportunity and obligation. We will not have, barring, of course, repentance, we won't have another opportunity to make something of this sparklet. You have one chance to polish this diamond, today's diamond. Don't lose it. Don't miss out on the only opportunity you've got to polish this particular diamond. And my grandfather continues in the essay, he says that this time of the year, of course, is the month of Elul, the month that is preceding the high holidays and the days of introspection of Rosh Yom Kippur. And he suggests it's quite possible that we have only one introspection to do, to ask the question, did we make the most of the days that we had? Or did we allow them to fall by the wayside? And did we allow those precious sparks, those precious diamonds that the might gives us to polish? Did we allow them to get flawed and blemished, God forbid? Maybe that's the only thing we have to think about. Did we make the most of these days or did we squander it? Of course, it's a very terrifying thought. It's terrifying when we think backward, retrospectively about the past. Did we squander our days of the preceding year? And it's also something we have to think about going forward to the future, to the year upcoming, 5782. We have days upcoming. Hopefully, the matter will give us all strength and good health. And we have days. And if we have days, it means we have diamonds. It means that we have sparks of soul that we're going to get it once. You have one chance to make something of this spark. Are we going to utilize that opportunity? Or are we going to squander it? They tell a story about a great man that every Yom Kippur, he made an assessment of every single day from the preceding year. Every single day, was it a check? Was it an X? Was it a day that that particular spark was tended to? Was given the life and vitality that it needs? Or was it squandered? Did I allow it to get blemished? And finally, he quotes a Talmud in Rosh Hashanah, page 16a. The Talmud says, Amar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi says, Adam nidom chol yom. A person is judged every single day. Every single day is an isolated entity of opportunity, responsibility. You have, on this day, one chance to uplift this diamond, to polish this diamond, to uplift this spark of soul. Tomorrow you're going to have a different spark. And you are judged every single day as to whether or not you made the most of this spark. Wow. Wow! Wowza! What a scintillating piece. Every day is a mini lifetime. Every day has its own little 
soul spark sparklet soulet every day of a spark do you have only once and we have to make something out of every day you can't say well i need to study torah and i'm very serious about my torah study i'm going to study 20 hours a week and i'll work really hard you know sunday monday tuesday wednesday and then i can have an extended weekend i've done my responsibility i fulfilled my requirement for that week we can't say that every day is its own isolated unit its own little mini lifetime and you can't neglect a single day because then there is a spark that is not influenced by yesterday's successes and today it needs to be tended to some companies have what's called a 980 work schedule you've heard of that it's a schedule where you work eight nine-hour days, one eight-hour day, and then you have one day off, meaning that the eight days that you work, nine hours, each one of those extra hours helps correspond for the day that you that you take off. So every two weeks, you take off from Friday, for example. That's the idea. And that works great in the world at large, but this is the opposite of how our spiritual responsibilities line up. It's not just about getting the requisite hours done. It's about not squandering even a single day. There is a blog on the internet called Wait But Why. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you haven't, but they have a feature in that blog called the Life Calendar. And it's like a big poster with a bunch of boxes And each box corresponds to one week that the average person lives. I think they have it to the age of 90. And it's a useful visual for making the most out of your time here. I think we should have a life calendar broken down to days, not to weeks. If you take the average life expectancy, of course, we don't believe in life expectancy. We don't expect anything. We don't deserve anything. Every breath is a gift from God. But nevertheless, if we take the average lifespan, so I actually Googled it. According to Google, in the most recent year, in the United States, the average person lives to 78.54 years. So if you multiply that by 365, that gives you 28,667. That is how many days, on average, around 30,000 days that a person has in this world. And every day is its own spark. Every day is its own diamond that you must polish, that I must polish. I think for me, this was a real eye-opener. I also think it's something I need to work on. You know, sometimes I have the feeling, whoo, I finished this week's slate of podcasts. I've done all my responsibilities. I've answered all my emails. Maybe I have a day off. Maybe I could take some time because now I've, I'm done. I'm done my job. I'm done my responsibility. So I could take a day off to do other things. That calculation makes sense if you're just trying to get a volume of work done. You could work less, take some time off, relax. You got futz around. But if you are told, as we are told, that every day is a diamond that needs to be polished, the money asks of you, here is your soul, your soul that you're sparkling for this day, polish it for me. Well, then you can't lose a single day. I have a dream, and I call my dream APAD. Not iPad, but APAD. Oh, what's APAD? APAD stands for A podcast a day a podcast a day every single day you do a new podcast and i was thinking well you can't really do it every single day maybe i'll take off friday and shabbos anyhow i never release a new podcast on shabbos or festivals but I, if i do a podcast a day five days a week there's plenty of work to go around i'll have to work even friday and shabbos just to prepare and to Think about all the things I want to talk about. There's plenty of work for me to do if I undertake a pad. Maybe that's what I should do. That's the lesson here. Every single day 
you have to have a touch point with your soul, with Torah, with mitzvos. Every day it's its own dime. You got to polish. You can't say, I'm going to work on a weekly schedule, a monthly schedule, a quarterly schedule, get my work done, and then I go on vacation every single day from when the sun rises to the sun sets. You are being urged make the most of this day because this is a part of your soul that shows up only once. Of course, with uh, repentance, you could retrieve it. But otherwise, it shows up only once. You go to sleep, you lose it. And if you have not done the requisite amount of work on that particular day to polish that diamond, well, then you have a problem because the money asked you to polish a diamond and you didn't do it. A pad. Is that a good idea? Do you think we could pull it off? I don't know, but that's what I'm thinking about here, processing this essay for my grandfather. I had one more thought over Shabbos on this subject that I wanted to share with y'all. And this is relevant to a discussion we've had a few weeks ago about the cities of refuge. Do you remember we talked about the cities of refuge? The sanctuary cities where people who kill accidentally, they run and they hide there until the death of the Kohen Gadol. So there were six such cities, and we talked about this in the past. And in last week's parsha, Parshas Shoftim, it says that in the future, they're going to add three more cities, bringing the total to nine. Moshe designates three cities. Joshua designates the other three cities on the east side of the Jordan. And then in the future, like in a messianic era, we're going to add three more cities, bringing the total to nine. Now, we asked the question in the past, Wait a minute, uh, we thought in the future, in the Messianic times, it's going to be like a utopian society. There's not going to be accidents. People are not going to be dying accidentally. Why would we need more cities of refuge in the future? And a few weeks ago, we gave an answer to that in the podcast that we did on the talent incubator on these cities of refuge. But maybe there's another answer here. This is what I'm speculating. I'm suggesting if you don't like it, send me an email. You do like it also. Maybe we can suggest, based upon this understanding, every day is its own little soul. You know, Rabbi Noah Weinberg of Lesson Marie used to say that wasting time is suicide in an installment plan. That's what wasting time is. We know that in Jewish philosophy, suicide is murder. You don't own your soul, it's the Almighty's soul. Can't kill your own soul. Well, if we put these ideas together, suicide is murder. And every day you have a little part of your soul that if you don't feed it, you don't tend to it, well, that part of your soul is blemished. We could say maybe is killed. Of course, it's something that we don't realize today. But in Messianic times, everyone's going to recognize, everyone's going to see how every day is a mini lifetime. And therefore, wasting a mini day is a mini suicide. But it was accidental. People didn't know about this. Nevertheless, once they figure this out, people are going to feel guilty. And they're going to feel an urge to sequester in a city of refuge. And there's going to be a need to add three more cities to accommodate the overflow. That's an idea. I don't know if it's true or not. It's speculation, but I wanted to share with you relative to this subject. But the general takeaway, I think, is profound. Every single day, you have a little part of your soul given to you. It's given to you one day and one day alone. You can't squander a single day. That's the podcast. Did it live up to the hype? Is this something truly unforgettable, as I promised? Is it going to reshape your life? Send me an email and let me know. Either way, my email address is rabbiwajima.com. Let's get to this week's A and Q. A and Q. And we're going to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, the Ben Sorer Umora, the wayward and rebellious son. I had the great fortune of writing a book on this subject many years ago. It's in Hebrew, and it is it's kind of scholarly, 
but I spent a lot of time thinking about this subject. The wayward and rebellious son, it's a very mysterious law. A small child, an adolescent, he engages in behavior that seems pretty innocuous to us. He steals some money from his parents. He buys meat and wine and he eats it in bad company. And for that crime, the wayward and rebellious son, the Ben Soromora, gets executed. What did he do so wrong? What's so bad about this behavior? Maybe, maybe he's a, you know, a child with uh, some delinquency issues. Maybe he needs to go to military school. I don't know. But to execute such a child for what seems to be relatively innocuous behavior, it seems like it's a bit excessive. So the Mishnah in the book of Sanhedrin, page 71b, actually addresses this question. And it says, Ben Sora Umora, the way by his son, Nidon al Shem Sofo is judged as per his future self. Let him die innocent and not die guilty. Explains the Talmud. A kid eats a certain amount of meat and drinks a certain amount of wine. Did it make sense to execute them? No. That's not enough to get executed. Rather, the Torah is able to foresee his future. And the Torah says that in the future, he's going to deplete his father's money and he's going to have an addiction to the meat and the wine and he's going to go and stand at a crossroads and steal from passerby and eventually commit crimes of capital severity. And he's going to be executed. It's better to execute the child now when they're innocent than when they are guilty. The Torah is telegraphing the child's behavior. If a child at this specific age, in the formative years of their adolescence, they do this specific cocktail of behaviors, says the Torah, he will definitely end up as a murderer. And therefore, it is to his benefit that he be killed innocent rather than guilty. That's what the Talmud says. That's how the Talmud explains this idea of a Ben Sora Umara being executed for what seems to be quite minor crimes. Of course, it's a hard pill for us to swallow. We are punishing someone ahead of time. It's punishment. Maybe it's preventative. The Talmud, of course, says that it in practice never happened. But regardless, it is a fascinating thought experiment. I think there's definitely a lesson here. Better to die innocent than die guilty. But here's the question. The Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, page 71a, tells us a very curious law. It says if his father wants to bring him to court, but mom doesn't want, or vice versa, mom wants, father does not want, he does not become a Ben Soromor. Both parents have to sign off on his execution for him to be executed. And here's the question. If this kid is to be killed because of his future behavior, kill him when he's innocent, don't wait for him to die of a crime, let him die innocent, he's going to die anyhow. Why do his parents have to sign off on it? Why is this the only crime that is subject to another person, another people's nod? If the parents insist that he gets killed, well then okay, we have to execute him. If not, if they choose to not bring the child to court, the child is absolved. If the child did any other capital crime, provided that the child is bar mitzvah, 13 for a boy, 12 for a girl, they are liable. And here's the one exception. The parents have to approve of the boy, the Ben Saramor, the wayward and rebellious son, being judged and executed. And the question is, why? Why is this mitzvah different? And if you have an answer, you can send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Now, last week, we asked the question about war. War seems to have contradictory laws. It's such an important mitzvah. You even have to endanger your life. By definition, going to war, you could potentially get killed. But it's also something that you can easily get away from. You could easily avoid the draft. You could easily avoid the conscription. There's a, you know, you're building a house and you're scared and you get betrothed to a woman. You planted a vineyard. 
why on one hand does it seem so important, on the other hand it seems to be something which is so easily avoidable. Now I have to confess, we are planning, please God, this week to do our annual pilgrimage back to Houston. Past couple of weeks we've been in Canada and we drive every year back and forth. So actually right now I'm recording it, it's early Monday morning, the exact time. Let me check my phone here. It's 1.22 a.m. So it's basically Sunday night. And I know that I haven't seen all the answers that will yet be submitted still early on in the weekly cycle. So you're going to have to hear my take on this question. And even though I asked this question myself, I think it's a flawed question. Because the question has an assumption that, in my opinion, is a flawed assumption. The assumption of this question is that if something's so important, we want the most people to be working on it. It's so important, you even have to die for it. We must need a lot of warm bodies working on it. I think, actually, that the opposite is true. I think this assumption is flawed. Specifically because it is the most important thing, we don't want so many people working on it. We want only the best and most dedicated. I think we really underestimate what a single person can do and what a small group of people can do. If you remember back in Genesis, we're almost getting back to there. I'm really excited to begin the sixth cycle of the Parsha podcast. Abraham was told that the city of Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed. And what did he start doing? He started praying to try to intercede on behalf. And he said, well, what if there are 50 righteous people and 40 and 30? 10. What if there are 10 righteous people? An entire metropolitan area that is destined to be destroyed because of their evil behavior. If there were 10 righteous people in the city, they could have saved everyone. What do you need to save an entire city? You need a handful of people. That's it. It's not about the masses. It's about dedication. I think one of the core messages that we tried to convey on the Parsha podcast is how every single person is a superpower. We, of course, are looking forward to the Messiah. And the Messiah is going to be one person that's going to transform the whole world. And in fact, our whole history is a story of individuals who changed the world. Of course, it's Abraham, Moses, and we're looking forward to Messiah. But every person has enough power within them to change the entire world. Every person is a nuclear weapon. A good kind of a nuclear weapon. And you don't need a lot of them to alter the course of history. You just need the dedicated. So the question's flawed. The question presupposes that we want so many... No, we don't want so many people. We want one or two or three. Give me some good men and women and we can change the world. I thank you for listening. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. And even though it's Sunday now, we are already planning for an amazing and festive and joyous Shabbos upcoming. And please know with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week.